1965, the Ontario government declared hospital workers to be an essential service, with the right to strike outlawed, all meaningful bargaining with the employer ended. The hospital's making us work double workloads. Oh. They don't want to pay us enough money. They want to take our sick leave away. They want to have make our uh, vacation pay less instead of more. I honestly don't think there'll be a strike. What we're hearing is just saber-rattling by some elements within the union. Too much work, too little pay. Too much work, too little pay. Too much work, too little pay. We've been through this kind of militant action with QP before. We assume we'll be proceeding to arbitration as the law provides. Looking at the future, our quest has just begun. Our challenge is to triumph over arbitration. This system's plowed us under and bent us to its will. We're overworked and underpaid. Government fiscal restraint programs slash hospital budgets. As a result, as many as 14% of support staff positions are eliminated. Speed ups and double workloads are imposed to prevent a decline in the quality of patient care. But hospital workers cannot cope with the cutbacks in staff and resources. Frustration and stress intensify as the quality of patient care declines and the number of compensationable injuries rises dramatically. Without the right to free collective bargaining, hospital workers cannot press their employer, the Ontario Hospital Association, to deal with these legitimate and urgent concerns. Since 1965, all disputes with the employer must be settled through binding arbitration. But workers have found the arbitration process to be sadly lacking in impartiality. In many respects, the arbitrator is the who has been appointed to the Ministry of Labor. And often, it can be that's done with the Ministry of Health behind the scenes saying, this person, because they're likely to rule on these issues in a favorable manner to the Ministry of Health. And what favors the Ministry of Health very definitely favors the OHA and vice versa. Arbitration award after arbitration award has consistently rubber-stamped the employer's position. Between 1976 and 1980, hospital workers' real earnings suffer a 20% loss to inflation, and they have the worst vacation package in the industry. Well, basically the law itself is totally unjust. Hospital workers have been declared essential in Ontario, but have never, ever been paid as essential workers. Arbitration over the years has proven to hospital workers that it does not work for us. It works against us. Well, the underlying uh, reasons for arbitration is that it's been forced on the hospital workers as an easy way for the government to get the settlement of contracts without, uh, without us as workers having the right to strike. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union till the day I die. A decade earlier, ten Toronto locals refused to submit their pressing demands to the biased deliberations of arbitration. Arbitration awards have condemned too many hospital workers to lives of poverty. You are hospital workers. And damn it, we've been fighting at each other long enough. And it's time we turn the guns around. The 2,800 members of Local 220, the Service Employees International Union, pledged to support the aims of the catch-up campaign. My instructions are to tell you that we are going to take a strike vote in our local union to back you up on May the 1st. Militant and unified, the hospital workers are determined not to submit their demands to arbitration. 
With the strike deadline only a day away, the government gives in. The 10 Toronto locals win an average increase of $1.50 an hour, a 50% increase. The settlement quickly spreads to all of Ontario's hospitals. But the gains quickly disappear. Union strategy remains geared to arbitration, but it's a strategy that ignores the strength of the membership. There is centralized bargaining, but there is no centralized mobilizing. It's not long before arbitration awards have eroded the gains made in 1974. Central bargaining in 1980 is a farce. The employer's offer, tabled at the last minute, does not address any of the workers' concerns. 91% of the hospital staff voted it down because we had such a poor offer. They were, we were understaffed, overworked. They wanted to take away our sick leave, and they didn't want to give us good wages. People were very angry. They were very angry at conditions in the hospital at the time. They were uh, angry at supervisors. They were angry with management. Uh, they were just tremendously dissatisfied with their wage level, with the poor increases they had received in the last several so-called arbitration cases. Uh, they were generally angry at the system. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to arbitration. In response to OHA's declaration that negotiations are over, province-wide information picket lines are set up. The employer's desire to proceed to arbitration is unacceptable to the vast majority of hospital workers. They are convinced that only through free collective bargaining can they reverse the erosion of their rights and working conditions. What else do you have in mind? Uh, well, we have uh, blue flooding in the shopping centers, uh, probably advertisements coming up in newspapers to show the people that we can't negotiate freely as other people in other sectors can. Is there any possibility at, at this point of an illegal strike? I can't discount that fact. The hospital workers' anger and determination is dismissed by the employer. I think that they thought that if we would go out on strike, that it would be just a few hotheads going out that they just thought, well, there's no way it's an illegal strike, they're not going to go on strike. They did not really negotiate anything. They tossed in an extra nickel when it was coming down to the strike deadline. They tossed in an extra nickel, hoping that hospital workers would do as they've done in the past and grab that extra nickel. But instead, we grabbed for the brass ring this time around. Personally, I felt that going out on strike might not be the right thing, but the, the way we had to work and the uh, many patients that we had to do, that you're so overworked that you couldn't give proper nursing care to those patients anyhow. No, and I think the patients were suffering just as right. much as the staff was. The patients were done like a minute car wash. Uh -huh. You should put your car through. It is hoped that the employer will respond to the strike vote and reconsider its opposition to negotiating a contract. OHA refuses, claiming that it is QP that has been completely unreasonable. As the strike deadline approaches, the Labor Relations Board intervenes. It orders all strike preparations to cease. Hospital workers refuse to back down. As far as defiance of the law, I, most of our members just didn't give a damn about the law. Because we were fighting for what we wanted, what, what we thought was fair. And you can't lose when you fight for what you believe in. That's right. You can't lose. Marching on together into the bitter night. The hardest choice we've ever made. Our decision is to fight and go on marching and singing and working and trying to keep us moving on and go on marching. Workers at 40 hospitals in 19 cities stand up to an unjust law. Took me all night to thaw, just thaw to the next shift. <laughs> well, some some of the picketers were coming with two and three coats on. If 
threat of fines doesn't really bother anybody because as hospital workers, we don't have the $1,000 a day to pay anyway. I think we just all stuck together and we were going to... We were just like a family. Yeah. yeah, we were going to beat management before they beat us. How are they going to jail 16,000 people? How are they going to afford to be able to keep us in there and yet not afford to give the hospitals enough money to give us what we're asking for? What we're asking for isn't unreasonable. Solidarity forever! Not halt or strike. As momentum builds, the media coverage becomes as impartial as an arbitration award. The situation is more serious at Riverdale Hospital, where most patients are in cure they go away. 150 volunteers are pitching in to do the menial tasks. The fact is they didn't recognize the problem that existed. They were just recognizing the fact these hospital workers went on an illegal strike. Many patients like Anthony Natale, a multiple sclerosis victim, cannot even take a drink without help. Nobody cared why we did. Nobody cared about our feelings about this strike and why it was done. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We strike support remains solid. 14,000 workers at 51 hospitals are now out. Local 220 of SEIU again pledges its support. If anybody had a good picket line, it was the Pearly. The chefs that was well organized. We worked days before the strike organizing uh, picket shifts and picket captains. The workers' solidarity is about to be severely tested. The Ontario Supreme Court grants Attorney General Roy McMurtry an injunction. It orders workers to return to work immediately. The injunction came down, we didn't care about that, so we were going to stick it out right to the end. The uh, biggest problem that I think that the average picketer had to deal with was not the injunction, was, was not all the, uh, the legal maneuvers to try and uh, destroy the strike, it was a uh, conflicting statement made by the, uh, the national president, Grace Hartman, where it, the statement seemed to say that she was ordering the workers to go back to work and to stop the illegal strike. It threw mass confusion into the picketers. The majority of workers remain out, determined to defy the injustice of a law that denies them the right to free collective bargaining. Almost immediately, picketers encounter increased police harassment. Any policemen out taking pictures? Have you seen any policemen out taking pictures? Pressure to crush the strike intensifies. McMurtry is urged to remind the workers that the law has teeth. The law has certain remedies when there is disobedience to a court order. Therefore, we in the Ministry of the Attorney General are pursuing whatever actions are necessary to bring those who are in contempt of the injunction before the court to answer for their actions. Insidious tactics are employed to try to break the workers' will. Landed immigrants report of receiving intimidating phone calls. They didn't say exactly who phoned them up. Uh, they were being threatened with deportation if they continued the picketing. If they continued breaking the law. The threat was made that they would be shipped out of the country if they continued striking. The pressure exposes fundamental weaknesses in the strike organization. In particular, the lack of an adequate communication system between locals hurts the strike. Isolated, some locals can no longer maintain their picket lines. Like if we had known where the weak areas were, they could have sent people down to rebuild and tell them how to how to build a proper strike and and how to keep the members out and how to keep their spirits up and to keep them up for the for the last few days that, that counted because we understood that they were the management was breaking in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. Like they couldn't have taken more than a couple of more days. The provincial strike has disintegrated. Only locals in Ottawa, Hamilton, Sudbury and Hawkesbury remain out fighting for a guarantee of no reprisals. The employer refuses, confident that the power of the government and the police will quickly crush the last of the resistance.
It was a very sorrowful, very emotional time, uh, a heartbreaker of a time. But I really know that they could have stepped on me and I wouldn't have felt any worse by being ordered to go back to work. I can't think of it today. I almost start crying. It was such an emotional experience that we would call the strike off. Hospital suspensions total 8,646 days. At Ottawa's Pearly Hospital, local 870 small union is pummeled. 25% of the bargaining unit is fired or laid off. I think their first concern was to break the union. Get rid of the union. Get rid of the union. They must have had meetings at night to figure out of the people on the executive, how many years they had Cause that's when they in seniority because they went right to get rid of the whole executive. They went from six years and under, and that got rid of the entire executive. Altogether, eight of the locals' members are fired, 37 are laid off, and 100 are suspended. Of the executive, only the treasurer and two shop stewards remain at the hospital. It is the most savage reprisal in the province. I mean, we went out believing that we, you know, one of our demands was overworked. When we went back, we had no union to back us, and it was almost, quote, slavery. I mean, you had to work, 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 because we knew 37 were out there, and we might be the 38th and 39th. The laid-off workers occupy the unemployment office to protest the hiring of staff to replace them. The union responds with legal action. We're charging the hospital with conducting an illegal lockout. Lockouts under the law are, are as illegal as strikes are. The labor community rallies to the defense of Local 870. $40,000 is raised to help pay mortgages and rents. Another arbitration award imposes a contract on hospital workers. The arbitrator, Paul Weiler, virtually rubber stamps OHA's original offer. The workers' concerns about their cost of living and the quality of patient care are dismissed, as Weiler warns hospital workers that there are only limited amounts of money to go around. A few weeks later, Weiler awards Ontario's doctors a handsome raise. This time, the arbitration award makes no mention of limited amounts of money. Conditions in there got worse and worse, and and there was less and less staff, and it just seemed to get more and more tense. And Contempt of court charges against hospital workers and union officers result in the jailing of three people, including the national president of CUPE. Others receive suspensions and fines. Local 870's lockout charges are brought before the Labor Board, the same board whose cease and desist order the hospital workers had defied only months earlier. I think that the Labor Board had the attitude that uh, QP was, had on the one hand uh, spit in the face of its authority and now was returning to it looking for justice and it was uh, uh, appropriate to, uh, you know, to, uh, to deal with us uh, in a similar fashion. The lockout charges are dismissed by the Labor Board. For most of the 37 workers, the decision means the end of their jobs at the Purley. Well, we just felt defeated. Yes. This was just terrible. That was an awful letdown. It was totally unfair. What did it mean to me? God, I could never tell you what it meant to me. How did management react? Very happily. Walk around the first time smiles. we ever saw them smile. Having exhausted the legal avenues with which to fight the layoffs, the local advises its members to upgrade their educational qualifications before their seniority rights expire. Upgrading means a two-year course on a manpower grant of only $90 per week. Four members enroll, determined to get their jobs back. 
Well, aside from the fact that there's three other people from the party with me, and we supported each other all the way, the four of us, and the thing that made me, and I'm sure the rest of them hang in there, was just getting to show the curly, just getting getting that revenge. And I had to push them and push them because many times they wanted to quit because they found it too hard. And she made it so much easier by saying, because I hope you fail. <laughs> I figured by using reverse psychology that it would just make the matter to go and go and to push ahead and get their certificate. The hospital announces its intention to lay off 12 more nursing assistants. Local 870 and the Ottawa and District Labour Council organize a campaign to expose the actions of the Pearly administration. They dished out the worst reprisals of any hospital in Ontario when the hospital workers went on strike a year and a half ago. They laid off 38 people at that time, supposedly because they were uh, renovating the hospital and were going to close some beds. That was a lie. They never renovated any hospitals. It was an excuse to get rid of those people. The campaign focuses public attention on the horrendous situation at the Purley. Name the hospital that fired the most employees after the 1981 strike. The Purley. Name the only hospital that hasn't rehired dismissed staff. The Purley. Reaction to the union's accusations from management? No comment. Our attempts to get through to both the hospital administrator and the director of personnel were stalled at the switchboard and a line of security guards and police officers made sure we weren't going to get through the front door. Jane Gilbert, CJOH News. I'm phoning on behalf of the Labour Council to tell you about the demo on Thursday at the Pearly Hospital. I'm calling to uh, remind you about the demonstration. The six-month campaign unites members of the labour and health communities. And any board with any brains knows that preserving or continuing some kind of petty political, philosophical fight with its unions, which is what's going on here, it is an awful small basis to continue the kind of things which must really, truly be damaging patient care across the street. Ottawa's mayor calls on the provincial government to launch a public inquiry into the management of the Purley. Under intense pressure, the Purley calls off the layoff. Management had their thrill when the arbitration came down about the 37 people laying off. Mm -hmm. They had their day, but we had our day. A provincial arbitration board reinstates Mike Hurley, the local's president. The hospital agrees to reinstate Sheila Casey, the local's vice president. I'm telling you, we're dancing and screaming up and down that hall. They thought we were going to lose them. We had defeated them in that one, and that was the biggest one that, that we wanted. Biggest, yeah. and, our, and the union was back, and it would grow, and That's it would right. get to be strong again. And I think more people are taking an interest in the, in the union because we know that it's impossible to work at the Curly without a union. And I think that's why more people are getting involved. As a result of public interest in the state of labor relations at the hospital, the union makes major gains in local bargaining. Four members receive their certificates as registered nursing assistants. They apply to the Purley for their jobs. And Mrs. Brown told us straight, she said, you know, really she didn't know why we were there to have this meeting because she owed us nothing, absolutely nothing. And I told her she, we had a job there. Grievances are filed. The women return to work and three of them become shop stewards. They know we're not fooling around there. Like, as Janet and I as stewards, they know we're not just fooling around. When we go in with agreements, they know we're in there and we mean business because we fought them for two years. And I'm not, and I'm not scared of them. The hospital harasses members over the use of sick leave. For the first time, employees hired after the strike file grievances. And the union fought it for them, and we won it. And, uh, and through, through things like this, small grievances, they're pretty important to them. And uh, they're seeing it now, because management's been doing this for two years on them just shoving all this at them and they're taking it and finally they realize they can fight back through the union. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to be afraid of management anymore, where we used to be before. And why aren't you afraid of them anymore? Because we've got something to back us up now. Our union's always waiting. Victory's not apparent, it's 
it's hard to see the game. We've encountered many problems, but determined we remain. The strength we found within ourselves has built a common bond. We struggle for our dignity and make our union strong. We started down a path that leads to victory. Now we boldly eye the future, for it is our destiny to keep on marching and fighting and working and trying. Fighting and working and trying to keep us moving.